Hello, hello everyone, and welcome to the most collectible podcast in the world, House of Games. I'm your co-host Rune, and today I'm joined by a man who ain't much of a collectible item at all. He's mass-produced, used by many, fungible as fuck, always on sale, but he is an absolute treasure if you ask his wife, and that's what matters. One wife's <laughs> husband is another man's host. My host, Otto! But before we head down that collectible rabbit hole, let's dive in to today's episode of House of Games. Welcome to today's episode of House of Games, and today, this week, to continue the theme of from last week, I'm thinking to do something like we did last week, something related to monetization and that whole thing. So we talked a little bit before starting the starting to record this episode, so I'm thinking to talk a little bit about perhaps collectibles and stuff like that, uh, about uh, pre-orders about collector's edition, uh, stuff like that. So I think the venue to start with, the thing that I think is the most, uh, what I have the most experience with is collector's editions. Mm. So that's something that I, you know, I guess you could say that uh, living in your 20s, being single and having no responsibilities, you could buy collector's editions for this and that game and... Uh, that was sort of a big part of your life, but anyhow, it was a, a great time, and uh, I really remember some of the collector's editions that I bought, that was really, it made the whole experience uh, special, yeah. Now, you said in your 20s and you were single and could spend money on these things, and then you sort of talked about them as if they don't exist anymore. Have your wife made, made sure they never see the light of day again or like, like most of us no 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 of course they i have them still uh, a little scattered around the house but uh. you know it's uh, there's no no uh, it's not the same as it were in the day so i remember for example when uh, skyrim came out i worked worked at a call center at the time and uh, during those days i remember that there were a handful of people in my team and people all over the the company that uh, somehow took a sick leave <laughs> on the 11th of november 2011 <laughs> uh, conveniently and mm. everybody knew what this was about mm. and it was sort of a big thing for for me as well i had pre-ordered the I think the biggest collector's edition you can, could. I still have the thing. So it's basically a... It came with an art book, which is like this thick, wow. 200 pages of uh, like art and stuff from from making the game. And then you have like this huge, like this big uh, of a box. And it came with a statue of one of the dragons wow. in the game, which was uh, really cool. And I really like those. Also, I think Uncharted is also one of those collector's editions I really, really remember. And it's sort of the point of doing the collector's edition isn't that it's just a a bunch of junk that you, you know, have no use for. Mm. But rather that it's something that sort of makes the game come alive, Mm. almost. Mm. For example, I remember in... It's probably a, a cheap thing to manufacture, but at least in, I think, Uncharted 3, I bought the collector's editions for that. So it came in a chest. It was sort of a small, like, cool. chest-esque replica. Yeah, so you open it, and in it you had, like, a statue of Drake, the main character, but also you had, like, a a, a small, I think it's plastic or really cheap metal or something, but uh, the ring that the main character has in the same leather strap, you could, so you could wear it and, mm. like, you know, <laughs> cosplay him if you want to. Uh. But, you know, that's sort of a, a attention to detail, something that I really think it's... It's not that common that big games do it nowadays, especially when we get have gotten to this everything is online mm. world. And everything is just a download or in some cases you even download the game before it's out and then you can 
actually click play when the the actual time comes for the release of the game. Mm. So it's not the same as <laughs> it's sort of as, as it always is with us too. I think it's uh, we're just longing for the good old, good old days, like uh, some grandparents or something. But mm. uh, that was really cool. Uh, something that I uh, that would be like. The, the height of doing a, a game release that you would make it yourself is that you make a physical release, make it as a product, and then release some amazing merchandise along mm. with it. I was just thinking about that as you were talking. Like, uh, uh, I think when you start out as a game developer, your first goal or dream is to get a game out, especially on the consoles that you loved playing on as a child. Um when I released mine on Nintendo Switch, it was just like, I can't fucking believe this. And then two years later or something, the Red Colon Trilogy, a physical copy of the game, and that was just, that was on par with having a child. And then now I'm f- like, w- when we start talking about this topic, or you mentioned it before the show, I, I just have all these ideas for collectible editions I want for my games. Now, granted, the Red Colony game is a collectible edition thing, but it's not the same because there is no statue. And that's sort of, I guess, you know, you become greedy, but that's what I would like to release a game and then have this sort of amazing collectible edition where, where you get a statue or something that is not just uh, the, the game. So, for example, the Red Colony Collector's Edition, it's... Uh, it's the game, it's a poster and like a small art book and a CD with the music, which is, you know, it's all and all is very cool. But it's not like uh, that I was involved in what it was going to be and, and all that. I was somewhat involved in it, but it was mainly Esoft Asia that sort of, I guess that's how the deal goes. This was through my publisher, so I was not very much in touch with any of this, to be honest. Uh, and I was so busy making uh, Knife Boy by the time this was happening, so I was quite uh, grateful that I didn't have to be more involved. But anyway, my point is that it there, it's a cool thing, of course. It's amazing, and it is technically speaking a collector's edition, because there's two versions, one with just the game and this one with the collector's edition stuff. But if I were to make... like I talked about it on the show before... It, I would love to go back and make like a trilogy version of Red Colony for PlayStation, but maybe change the graphics completely t- just to make it more fun for me to work on the game. And then I like to imagine, oh, how cool would it be if you had like this, a statue? What I imagine is this uh, plate, like a round plate, and then you have Maria, Nicole, and uh, Mina, the main characters from each game, and they're sort of like posing with the guns aiming outwards, if you if that makes sense. So imagine this round statue. So that means no matter from all directions you walk, you will have one main character aiming at you or looking towards you. And then sort of behind them, there's like this velociraptor and a robot and a zombie. So uh, anyway, that's what I was thinking. And then I was thinking, ah, oh, it would be so cool to have like, imagine the zombie sitting down and then he have a, he slice from head down and that's where you inject the CD. So imagine the PlayStation 5 CD. Oh. So you can sort of s- insert that into the zombie. So when you don't play the game, it's uh, it's all a part of this uh, statue. So it's all in one sort of. And then I was thinking, ah, how cool would it be if, you, if this plate was rotating as well? So it's rotating and then... Uh, because take, normally when you have these collectible editions in, out in, in your room or whatever, you put them in a glass case or a bookshelf. So I was thinking that would be so cool if it was spinning. So you, it keeps spinning and then you have that CD. You can sort of inject that in the zombie. And then, of course, I thought, well, what if I could make this for the Nintendo Switch? Well, then it would be, the zombie will have like a, a slot in its face or something where you insert the, the Switch uh, cartridges or whatever. And it's like blood and stuff like that. So anyway, all these ideas on what to do with a collector's edition. And that would be so cool. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's uh, I guess next goal one one of these days yeah. make a collector's edition. And I think that uh, like as a developer, I wouldn't give a fuck if I didn't make money off this. All I would care about is having this thing. And if I yeah plus minus zero, that would be fine. Probably minus 
a couple of thousand dollars, I would be fine with that too, <laughs> just to have this thing. That would be so cool. But yeah, so that's a little bit about uh, my dreams when it comes to collector's editions. But with that being said, like you, you mentioned before that uh, nowadays we just buy everything online and so on. Like I am only buying physical games still, except on Steam. And I, I can tell, man, the Steam Deck. I, I have no love for the thing, and I really think it's because I don't buy the games physically. I, I think we haven't talked about this, but the original Xbox back then, my brother and I, we hacked it or shipped it, whatever you call it, flashed it, and uh, we only have two games for the original Xbox, and that was Halo. The, it came with it and Morrowind. Halo, amazing. Morrowind is my maybe one of my favorite games of all times. But all the other games we played on that system, we just downloaded and printed out on DVDs and and chucked it in. And there was like no, I felt like no value, no point in it. They, nothing stuck. And I th- really think there's something to this buying a physical. I sound like an old person, but buying a physical game. Uh, full price especially and then you take it home and you play it I still do that and especially I always buy the collector's editions if they exist but you know like you said you bought the insane uh, Skyrim one which I really want to see I'm gonna maybe we have to google some pictures after this but uh, those are extremely expensive obviously Uh, something you can only do in your 20s when you're single and have a job and all that stuff but uh, I like to buy this sort of semi collector edition, sort of what I described Red Colony as. And they're just maybe, instead of 70 bucks, they might be $99. So it's only a $20, uh, $20 difference. And they come yeah. with a couple of things. Or like a steel case, if that's a thing that's out, I like to buy those. So I, I always buy the collector's editions if they exist. Uh, on Nintendo, they have, uh, they have these. Uh, the, Official Nintendo games like uh, uh, Yoshi's, Wool and Worth, uh, Woolly World, Mario, and so on. You can on Amazon. You can buy them with a key ring that comes with. Uh, I I just noticed that side. I, I never bought yeah. them like that, and and also I I don't like to buy everything on Amazon. I want to go to real stores like an old fashioned man. But I guess um, that was just like yeah, my nostalgia for. Uh, collector's editions. I'm curious where we take the conversation from now on. <laughs> Are we just gonna talk and compare collector's editions, or what yeah? You... So I'm thinking the way to to take it actually is to take an, other examples actually that I didn't buy myself. But so we will talk about you know what is the ideal, what is what makes collector's editions fun. But I'm thinking to bring up uh, examples where they they weren't fun and where they there was a lot of problems, and then that usually when that happens, it usually goes to the discussion of should people pre-order games or or not? Uh-huh. Should you wait until it's it's uh, ready or or should you? pre-order it Mm. so i remember when i was a kid when gta 4 came out i remember that that was actually i didn't buy the collector's edition because i wasn't old enough to buy a grand theft auto at the time but um i heard at that they had a really cool collector's edition for gta 4 where they had where they shipped it with knuckle irons made out of bronze <laughs> with the game which is kind of funny oh. because it goes sort of in line with the game however oh. in sweden that's illegal to ship weapons to people oh. so you can't sell that so when those things arrived in sweden as far as i've heard the rumor at least is that all of them got confiscated and like destroyed or something so Huh. You know, that's sort of something that they didn't think about, but something that it was a really cool idea, but it really didn't pan out, I think, the way they mm. hoped it would. Mm. Something else that I really remember is Fallout 76. That's been, a, you know, a, a clusterfuck of problems. 
you know, on, on every level, I think. Mm. But something I remember was the collector's edition that sounded like a really, really cool thing. To go back a little bit, the Fallout 4 collector's edition had a really... I didn't buy it, but I really wanted to, to do that. But it was in part a power armor helmet... So sort of a helmet like from the game, ah. which was really cool. Mm. And then you had they built an app for your smartphone, so you could have the Pipboy, the basically the menu system in the mm. game on your smartphone. So you, you you could actually interact with the game mm. from your phone. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll I keep, just, go- uh, keep going. On. I, I got to show <laughs> something. Keep going. Yeah. So and something they sold, I think it was in that same. Collector's edition as the 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 helmet was the a pipo like a physical bracelet where you could fit your smartphone in and have like a a pipo as you were playing the game and then you would just you know click on something on your actual arm instead of doing it in game and it would work the same way which I thought also was really really cool and now I'm really curious to see what you're gonna bring up. From your magic box. Holy shit, do you have it? Oh my god, exactly, yes! <laughs> exactly, that's the one. <laughs> Holy shit, so does it work the way I thought it would? Uh, well, I don't... It's sort of like... Um, I haven't tried it. Uh, I, I went my to god, this... My god, you have it. Yeah. Holy shit. <laughs> and this, if my cool. brother watched this, he's not gonna watch this episode. He doesn't even know we make a podcast. But I bought this for my brother. <laughs> he's a huge Fallout fan. And I found this in yeah. one of those flea markets. Uh, wow. It's really cool. And it's gonna take out half of my... Mint condition from the looks of it. As yeah, well. yeah. I mean, oh, that's the beauty of all these flea market things in Japan. Everything is mint condition. I think it has something to yeah. do with this Japanese Buddhist culture where they take care of things. Yeah. There is yeah, not absolutely. a single scratch on this thing. It's and wow. It so how much was that? Uh, I bought it for hundred bucks. Damn. I mean, that's. I think it's. But I think you good can value. Find, yeah, I, I think you can find them uh, and uh, on online for about that price. So if you really want one. Damn. And yeah, this is a steel I case. I didn't expect. Uh, perfect. I didn't expect this at all. That you would have the actual thing yeah. <laughs> I was talking about. I was amazing. <laughs> yes. When you talked about the the power helmet, I was like, oh, I really hope he goes uh, the pit boy direction because <laughs> I was just gonna mention the pit boy. Yeah. Just, but then you went there, and I was like, I have to show this. Yeah, absolutely perfect. Okay, uh, there, viewers. You, so now you've seen exa- exactly that thing. Really amazing. Really cool. Mm. Collector's edition, the way to do it basically. It's like you can bring the game out into the real world. Mm. And also and have this stand you can if you mm, not yeah. want to have it in the box. Very, very cool. Mm. So yeah. Um someday if I when we meet in real life I have to take a look at that. It's uh I'm uh <laughs> I'm fanboying already. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. Um I can imagine my brother is just going to walk around with it like a clock used to be annoying. <laughs> but Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's uh I agree. That's uh, the way to do it. I don't know the Fallout did, what, what was the problem with Fallout 76? Yeah, so they first released Fallout 4, great game, great product, everything went well, and after that they released Fallout 76. So famously Todd Howard did a presentation on this game as he usually does and as usually he sort of either he exaggerates or he you know tells the world the plan that currently is but then a couple Mm. months down the line things have changed budgets have changed and so on Mm. don't know what it is uh i i don't really care Whichever, mm. uh, but people seem to be so frustrated with it. Anyhow, he said something like with 76 that it would have 16 times the detail of Fallout 4, for example, mm. Mm. Uh, which turned out not to be the case. Mm. Uh, it was basically the same and in many cases worse. Mm. So, 
Anyhow, they released the, the game. It's an online game only. And uh, of course, the online part didn't work at all. And there was so much many glitches and people found bugs and they found like the test room, which is, you know, where you could just spawn all of the enemies, all of the weapons, everything. And people got banned and mm. uh, all all kinds of things. We could go through, you know, the actual game part in, in another, another video. But... What went wrong with the collector's edition? So the I think the highest tier of the collector's edition was two things I remember in particular was in part a not or it was a, a canvas bag. So imagine canvas like really sturdy like uh, fabric that you have for like. Uh, army clothes and so on mm. uh, so basically a duffel bag like a sports bag uh, in that material that was sort of branded with the fallout uh, brand mm. and then also beyond that the other thing I remember was the, a whiskey bottle that was with the whiskey in it of course oh, cool. that would be branded as the in game soda so Nuka Cola I think ah. which two really cool ideas for a you know so then you could sit there with your uh, amazing bag and you could have your which you could use like in real life or you know going to the gym or whatever mm. traveling or uh whatever and then you could drink your whiskey as you're playing the game on opening night for example mm. really neat ideas but so i the way i heard it is that the canvas bag which you expect to be in a you know, stirred material and all of that. When it arrived, it was apparently in nylon. Mm. So <laughs> imagine this. It's basically, imagine you, you expect this real bag and what you get is ba- basically an Ikea bag. Uh, <laughs> that's, uh. you know, it's just a plastic bag with a zipper on mm. it. Uh, that's completely flat when it's uh, not filled with anything, so mm. it looks like shit. Mm. And it's even not even the same thing that's advertised on the the web page. Mm. So it's in many countries, it's illegal to do that. That you advertise one thing and then you don't deliver on that, but mm. give them something completely different. Mm. And then also with the whiskey thing, I. I no idea what it was like the actual actual liquid if it was good or not mm. but they served it in a the bottle or bottle was a like a white label whiskey bottle that they had like a plastic shell on the outside to make it look like the bottle from the game ah. which is sort of rocket shaped I, I think see. Uh, but the problem with that was like the plastic casing outside was like re- of really bad quality. So what happens when you try to pour the drink is that the drink didn't go into the glass. It went between ah, the inside, like the bottle and mm. the outside plastic. Just to go inside like the plastic and then it drips all <laughs> over the table or whatever. Mm. So uh, that's uh, just everything went completely wrong with that. I that's really odd. Like if you're if you're that big of a studio. Uh, and almost like I sort of alluded to earlier, if I made my own collector edition, I wouldn't even care if I went plus on the the whole thing. But yeah. you know, it's a big corporation, and that's what it's all about, uh, I suppose, uh, in terms of Benest, Bese, or Benesta, whatever, however you pronounce. <laughs> I never really figured it out, even though I'm a big fan. I hope somebody makes a super cut of you <laughs> mispronouncing their <laughs> name. Yeah, but anyway, they. Um, if you're that big studio and you have that much money, like, and also the fans, are, like, don't they know, like, they should have made it proper quality all the way through and just adjusted yeah. the price after that. And let's say they want to make profits for every collector. They will still get them sold. That's the thing. Like, there's no yeah. point in cheating when you're that big and you have that much money and you have that yeah. many fans that are willing to buy these things. So there's yeah. no point in cheating at all. It makes no sense. Yeah, absolutely. And as I, you know, I would also think the same way that if you look at Skyrim, for example, that's had a, a lifespan of over 10 years now. Mm. So, you know, going on 15. 
and it's still you know people can play that they re-release skyrim all over and over again mm. but you know it's a really smart way of you know keeping a game alive and keeping it updated mm. and keeping it you know and people actually do like it people play it people buy it mm. yeah. and if you have something like a brand like that like bethesda is then you would you know and also the the pre-orders and the collector's edition is only for launch that's i can't even imagine that you know let's say in best case scenario they would have the collector's edition that's a hundred thousand units of the highest tier. Mm. i don't even think that's gonna be a realistic number but say like it would be that mm. even if they would take a loss on those one hundred thousand games all of the goodwill that that makes will probably sell like i don't know five million copies or whatever down the line mm. 10 years into the future because you're as you said that big of a company so why not just invest in that because it's not about you know making money on each canvas bag because you're not a canvas bag company mm. it's about creating goodwill and you know when it's a game launch from this company it's happening it's an event it's like mm. a, you want to be part of a, you know you want to be able to say i was there i got the bag like you can show off that mm. pip boy like in real life it's a really cool thing <gasps> and you know i guess if you want to have the cookie and eat it too you could always uh do a announce the collector's edition and i was thinking you you because hardcore fans, they will always be there no matter what you do. So you could announce the, the collector stuff and say, just be honest and say, based on how many pre-orders we will, the price will be from this to this. Or uh, like, if you don't want to invest, let's say you lose a lot of money on making those bags, for example, like proper quality. Like, wouldn't that be a way where you could sort of announce what you have planned for this collector edition and then based on the pre-orders you adjust the price based on that so if you can get 100,000 pre-orders let's say you can make the the super quality or, or yeah you make it high quality and all that you have 100,000 pre-orders that means that the price will be 120 bucks per uh, collector edition or if you only get 50,000 pre-orders, then the, it will be $140 per collector edition. So you can sort of like... ah, But I guess that makes it messy. I think you're right. Just uh, Even if you go a little bit minus, when you're that big of a company, you can afford it and the goodwill and all that. And I was thinking like maybe they can hold some of them back. Like this Pit Boy glove, for example. Imagine if they had like... They kept 5,000 of them somewhere and then these become collector edition things that yeah. people really want after the fact. And then you can charge even more for them. Yeah, and I'm thinking like... Even if, you know, it's, it's easy to... S- as I often say, it's easy to sit here as a schmuck and say, you know, oh, they're so fucking stupid. <laughs> Why didn't they just do canvas bag the right way? I have no idea how to produce or even, you know, get a, a supply chain to do that. Mm. But I imagine it's something like this. They have a supplier that does the whole thing. Mm. They just pay the price per canvas bag. Mm. And even if the price would be like a thousand bucks per canvas bag mm. then just say that mm. you know we have the fucking highest here it's a fucking thousand dollars mm. per bag mm. you know we get that you're not gonna buy it but if you really want a good bag here it is it's mm. a quality bag it's gonna be the best it's gonna be doesn't matter that it says fallout on it it's gonna be a great product mm. but also you get the plus of supporting the game and it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to buy this specific thing mm. and so on just do that rather have like a really expensive price for it just to be sure that if the, you know prof- short-term profits is that big of a concern mm. rather than saying it's just a hundred bucks and then Maybe, maybe you can't deliver on it or whatever mm. it is. <gasps> oh, yeah, I agree. I think it's, um, there's a, it's probably what you say. It's just, they have no, they're not in charge of how it goes down. But it, when it's the highest tiers, it really feels like you can charge whatever you want. 
because yeah, collect. Yeah, but I mean, it's gonna be <laughs> if I were a, a big company like Bethesda, why not just do that and you know say that hey, we're not like Electronic Arts or Ubisoft. We're like the the Gucci or Prada of games. Mm. You know, we're the Ferrari. You mm. know, you want to buy our games to cost a lot of money, but mm. damn, you get value for your money. You mm. get, you know, you want to buy merchandise from us? It's amazing merchandise. Mm. You know, anyone would recognize it, even in the fashion industry. Mm. That's how good our merchandise is. Mm. You know, something like that. Either do that or don't do it. Mm. Especially when it comes to something physical, because... You can't patch a canvas bag. No, you. Oh, or actually, you can. You can. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But anyhow, so that leads into when this whole thing with Fallout seventy six happened. People said a lot about pre orders in general. That pre orders are sort of harmful for the industry in the mm. same way that microtransaction and games as a service and that whole thing is mm. harmful to the industry. So I'd love to hear your take on it. But the premise is basically like this that people say that if you pre order a game, you basically pay them before the game is released. Mm. So then the consequence from that is that. It doesn't really matter if on launch day the game works as it should mm. or if everything is broken. They already have your money and then they can use that money maybe to fix the game, but maybe they don't, mm. for example. But then you have just rewarded them with hundreds of millions of dollars mm. aggregate to create something that is uh, just broken mm. and then they can release earlier because they already got the money from their investment so they want to maybe start working on their next project mm. or something or making a DLC instead mm. so and the argument then is that if you don't pre-order there are zero pre-orders hypothetically mm. so then instead it would be like Shit, we don't know if this is going to sell or not. We mm. better make it uh, the best game we could do mm. and uh, fix all of the bugs, test it thoroughly, and make sure that on launch day and, you know, immediately that the game is great. Mm. That's basically the premise. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Should people pre order or not? Or, you know, what's the effect of it? No, I honestly, like, uh, I, I, I know I mentioned earlier that they should just ask people to pre-order these physical things. And I was thinking, like, huh, like, I have never pre-ordered a game myself, never. And I don't think I will ever do that. Uh, and then as we're talking about collector's editions, I th suppose that's the only time I would want to pre-order, but not for the game, but for the collector item that comes with the game. Uh, but at the same time, with your the way the stuff you said there, that I would still probably send the wrong signals, um, because I, one thing I tend to do is not buy games at launch at all nowadays because they are so broken all the time. I prefer to use wait a couple of months. I know uh, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. I'm gonna get that when we move back to Sweden and get a new TV and all that stuff. But I had like a big nice patch the other day. Um, I would like to, I mean, I, I'm so anti this sort of online updating stuff, even though I have to use it myself for my own games, but I, I, I think that, uh, like even when they print discs, sometimes they will use the latest version of the game to print the disc. If I understand things correctly. So when I buy these like Game of the Year editions, for example, then I want the la like the, the proper version that works on the disc. I believe I went to my summer house one summer uh, to play a game and it was just so broken. But then I had to go back to the city, up, uh, download the latest patch for the game, and then it was like working fine. That's so frustrating. Like even on physical discs you don't get the latest or a working thing, which is very frustrating. So they basically just print these discs before, before the game is done, send them out, and then you buy them day one, and then you first thing you do is download some bullshit patch. So I'm anti all of that, and I think you're right that it sends the wrong signals when you pre-order stuff. 
uh, I would like to make a small uh, different, like when it comes to these collector's editions, I suppose I could maybe break my own sort of rule here to go out and, and pre-order them if there's something that was really cool and I had the money. Uh, but um, I, yeah, let's see. You were I forgot the the question. So the the question I think is so what's the aggregate effect effect on the games industry? I guess from pre-orders is it a a net positive or, ne- or a net negative? Net negative. I think anything that where you try to cheat and cut uh, cheat the system or or take shortcuts, all of that shit. No matter what, if it's the gaming industry, if it's your health or in your own body, like it's never good long term. Nothing is good long term when you're trying to find shortcuts and 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 cheat the system or whatever it is. Just do it properly always. I remember. Uh, a podcast long time ago this uh, David Jeffy the guy who made Twisted Metal uh, he said something like uh, developers should only have three extra lives so you can only update your game three times after release and I thought that was a quite neat idea and then he was sort of shut down by the hosts of the show or maybe it was a new story and then whatever but uh, people then make the argument that it's great that developers can keep updating their games after release because it turns them into the best product it, they could be but if you go back in time before internet and all that stuff games were the best products they could be when they came out because they fucking did it properly they didn't just release broken ass games so in a weird way the these um us gamers as well who who have that argument that these games can become the best versions of themselves we're sort of like uh what is it called uh running the fool's errand or something like that like we, we yeah. are allowing this bullshitter to happen because it doesn't have to be this way it could really be that if you had proper rules that this is how you can only update your game three times, for example. Then developers would think twice before they release a super broken game. And uh, another beautiful thing I suppose could happen with that rule system, or, you know, no updates at all. But let's say you get three extra lives. Another beautiful thing that could happen by living in that world is that developers will uh, make more proper games they could still do this pre-order stuff because they know they only have three extra lives after release and when those extra when you have used those three extra lives it's done like if it's still a broken ass game that's gonna hurt your reputation so bad that you will do better next time there is no in sentiment in to to do uh, the best job you can anymore and it's just not with the not only with the gaming industry, I think that everything is like this nowadays. It's something sick about us people. I think about the the pandemic. The clearest way to stay health uh, to not die from this is just to eat healthy, move, exercise, live healthy. But it's like we don't want to do that. We want to keep eating shit. We want to keep sitting home and play video games, and we just wait for the vaccine. It, it's just everything is like that nowadays. There's no sort of there's no reason to do things properly. There's never a reason to like get up and fucking work. It's just ah, I don't know, man. I'm rambling at this point, but I, I think that's it's the same with everything. We, there's no reason to do things properly anymore. Uh, uh, it's frustrating, but I think yeah, that three strikes and you're out rule. I really think long term that could have a really positive effect because then it will be some sort of wake up call that we will actually try harder to make our be- games as good as possible on release. What do you think about that? Yet again, I've come up with some bullshit rule and you're going to say some philosophical Swedish thing <laughs> where you nuance the shit out of it and then I'm just going to take it back. Yeah, well, I actually, I agree w- with you. Um, let me see. So... Okay, so I would say something like this. Uh, absolutely, I agree. Uh, it's, you know, I think with also one thing, I don't know if it's the 
the internet is necessarily the cause or if it's just a symptom that creates this whole shit mm. where you don't make the game complete it and then release it but rather than you release it and then the players are the testers basically mm. uh, and then you have like the community mod it to patch it and then you just take from that mm. but it's rather I think it's just people get so boxed into their it's like paralysis by analysis that making a game I couldn't tell you exactly how how things go at Bethesda but I imagine it's like this you have a certain like process for how testing should go or when a thing should be released or whatever and it's just okay now it's two weeks now we gotta go to the next feature now Mm. it's two weeks we go to the next one and then testing is gonna be exactly this much testing and whatever and it's it feels to me at least that people get so much tunnel vision and not just looking at the whole thing something like something that john no is it john romero the guy who made doom anyhow Mm. Uh, he said that, uh, I think it's John, John Romero, he said at least that when uh, he made Doom, there was no QA department, no testers. So you were responsible for your own code. So his rule was to never let anyone else see your bugs. Of course, nobody can be perfect, but I feel like people should be sort of like, everyone should be have the same vision and have like doesn't matter what it takes we just make the best game doesn't matter with what department you are can you test it and can you make it better can you spot an issue fix it mm. whatever uh, there's this uh, quote from uh, this uh, movie called dolomite is my name it's from uh, it's eddie murphy plays uh like a real inspired by real story type character where they he's just a you know a schmuck making a movie where he has no experience making a movie and you know just doing whatever it takes to to do it even though he knows nothing about it he has to learn and then when he you know he needs money so he learns how to make the money and then Mm -hmm. when he has the crew he doesn't know how to manage the crew he has to learn that and then there's this one scene where he manages to get like a big time actor to play one of the like side roles and this guy acts all you know diva you know he doesn't want to do this or that and somebody has to grab coffee for him and you know while everyone is just busting in their ass and just trying to make this the best movie it doesn't matter who they are they just uh you know so here's the quote at least i can't deliver it like eddie murphy uh, but he said this at least. Uh, here's the quote. I know you missed the big time, but the rest of us ain't never done no shit like this before. I'm paying for this whole goddamn thing. I ain't got no fucking ego about it. If a box needs to get moved, I will move the box. And if the crew get hungry, I will go downstairs and start making sandwiches. Because we are here to work together to make a movie. Mm. And, you know, this... Uh, Again, I probably butched it, but this quote in this movie, it's just so beautiful that that's sort of what you would like it to be, that Mm. pre-order or not, that with the game, it feels like people are, it's too much of just just a job, Mm. because to me and to many other people, it's an art Mm. games, and it feels like if you work... With art, it you would like it to be like everyone has this vision that it's not just a nine to five. We're here to make the best fucking game we can make ever. It's gonna be quality in everything. If anyone sees anything that needs fix, it doesn't matter that you're not in the QA department, mm. or it doesn't matter that you're not a programmer. It doesn't matter that you know if you see a problem with the lighting then doesn't matter that you're the marketing guy. Mm. You see that problem, then 
you know, we work together to fix that problem. Mm. No blame. It's just we want the best product. But mm. it feels too much that people are like in this tunnel vision. You have this department, you have that department. And, you know, we have this amount of budget and we have this uh, sprint that is two weeks. And, you know, mm. it's too much analysis, too much, you know, what I want is uh, ruthless pragmati pragmatism if it would be possible. Mm. You know that nothing can defeat us. We can do anything. We just have to, have to set our minds to it. Mm. And, you know, it doesn't mean that you have to work 16 hour days or anything like that. Maybe you can start to make the game small, but make that small game something real mm. um yeah sorry i'm babbling too much mm, no I'm, I'm 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 starstruck i didn't know i was making a podcast with eddie murphy uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh well i think uh, oh my God. yeah you're right and uh, but i was thinking because i remember when we had a meetup with the uh, house of uh, umi game hub which how this yeah. whole podcast started right uh, we talked yeah. to this lady who sort of made an argument for instances in work. Uh, do you remember that? And it was sort of like, ah, we were supposed to have her on this podcast and talk about that whole concept of working in instances, or if it was something else, another method, maybe sprints, she talked about. Sprints, I think you mean. Oh, sprints, uh, yeah. Would, yeah, because that's the part of the agile thing that uh, is all the rage. So basically what you do is you work in two week increments, I think, something like that. And then uh, you have two weeks to say that we need to in implement the, I don't know, save feature or we need to implement the uh, multiplayer or something. We do that in two weeks mm. and then, or we do it in two week increments. So maybe you do the login feature that takes two weeks and then next you do the I don't know, maybe uh, community chatting mm. functionality or something. And then you sort of, after each sprint, you, I think you review how that two weeks went, and then you try to use that to improve or something like that. Uh, yeah. But would you say that uh, the, the, the way you sort of describe this tunnel vision, is that the same thing or is that different? Like, would that sprint stuff work on a game like, for example, Fallout uh, or... So, I haven't worked in sprints myself. This is coming for me as an outsider, but to me, at least, stuff that I've done, if we, you know, it's not completely comparable, but say this podcast, for example... Mm. I sort of am a very shoot from the hip kind of guy, and I think you are too in many ways. Mm. And I think it's. I work a lot, like, I think. Let me double check here. I'm just gonna not butcher his name again. Once again. Uh, yeah, it is John Romero, he, the guy who made Doom. Mm. Anyhow, another thing he said was that he never prototypes. So that's something I see a lot with game companies as well, that they have to do a, a prototype or a you know, vertical slice or whatever it is, and then after that, they make the game. But mm. he never does anything like that. He just makes a game from like the first line of code that goes into the game, and mm. then he just makes the levels and all of it, uh, which is sort of how I work as well. Mm. Say with this podcast, I've heard a tip from another podcast that I listened to that you should make six episodes or something and then throw them away because then after six episodes, you sort of get used to it. And then the first episode that gets released to the public sort of sounds good. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, but uh, we released almost, I think we did one actually, one pilot episode mm -hmm. that's not released to the public just uh, to Game Hub Umeå. Mm. But beyond that, we just went directly mm. uh, from the start, and it was we've never had any like project management. We've never had like meetings <laughs> about no. this podcast, and we've never had like a structure. We had like an we had, like an Excel sheet, you know, mm. write stuff if you want to. Mm. Um, here's a couple of guests. I stopped <laughs> updating the guest list uh, mm. long ago. 
and now I do it, uh, you know, here and there mm. sometimes. Um, and it feels better, I don't know, to me at least, it feels better to just, instead of focusing on all the, the, this administration and overhead and stuff, mm. instead just focusing on doing. Mm. And that's, you know, what we've been doing with the podcast and mm. with the little experience I have in game development, there's no meetings or plans or roadmaps or anything like that it's just doing mm. uh, the things that need to be done mm. and i think more of that and less of this uh, planning everything to oblivion mm. would be better yeah i, I th- think yeah i was um not sure how i ended up here but i wanted to say uh, something regarding sunset moon now that i'm getting a vertical slice out or you know i like to use call it a demo uh and as I'm playing you it know, now... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I've actually learned a new term for this uh, recently that I've never heard before uh, that I think sort of describes uh, what's the step before vertical, vertical slice. I just want to get this out there mm. for people to know the industry talk. Mm. But uh, there's apparently something called a beautiful corner. So basically what you do is you make one corner of the game like really beautiful that looks like the finished game but it's oh. just one corner so if you just turn around you'll it it will look like shit yeah. or, or it would look like nothing at all yeah uh but that's something that people do as well uh yeah usually. So, but i would say sorry, that's what ahead. i'm doing then because i yeah i keep saying like i this demo area is just there are fences and you can't walk beyond them and if you, even if you were to glitch through these fences there are houses there, but if you walk inside them, there's not no details or anything inside those houses. Um, and yeah. even like the houses within the fenced area are more are prettier than the ones outside and so on. But I I think that um, uh, I, I mentioned this before. Like, as I'm trying to finalize this demo and make finish it up, I realized that I'm 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 finishing up the whole game, man. Like everything in this demo is like. The only function I can think of so far that is not in this demo is the animals that you can buy and uh, raise animals. But pretty much everything else is inside this demo. So I feel like I'm finishing up the game. And one thing I noticed when I played it the other day is something that I noticed with all my other games. And that's maybe this Doom guy that I have the same approach as him that... I never do prototypes. I never do. I just make the game. And one thing I've thought about the other day when I was playing it, it, it on the Steam Deck, it's like it, it doesn't really feel the way I wanted to. And had I, and this is like maybe something that you would do early on to make it feel right in terms of the controller. But you know, it's a top-down game, so it it shouldn't be. Um, it shouldn't. Um, there's only like one way of doing that, but I, I I feel like it's a little bit too sloppy the controller. But I don't know if it's the 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 cross on the Steam Deck or when I use the joystick that makes it feel like that. But I feel like these games in, in typically you can only walk like straight lines, and I think that's something I might want to implement later on. At least for the NPCs, I want them to walk straight lines. They can sort of like take curves and so on. And I know that uh, takes more CPU power, for example. So my program later, so they only walk straight lines when they go to wherever they want to go. But my point is, is that this late into development, I am trying to fix the game uh, to feel right. That's maybe something you would have done earlier on if you were that sort of prototype person. But I'm still not sure if that would have helped because if I were to try the controller in a prototype stage. Uh, and that stage is not going into the game, it will still maybe feel weird later on in the game. For example, if I were to prototype this game, maybe I would just have a gray scene and like white blocks as walls, and then I run around there and try the controller. But there's no, like, what would you say? Because there's no world there and there's no details and so on, it might feel fine, but once you slap in the details, you realize like, hold on, when I go from here to here, that's like a whole block in the game. So then you would have to adjust this after the fact anyway. So I, I really don't believe in this sort of prototyping stuff. I just think that you should do it, and then you can 
adjust it as you go on until it feels right. Um, not sure how I ended up there, but uh, yeah, the the demo is basically a beautiful corner of the game, and it's very much a full game in the game. I think the whole demo is going to be like maybe six hours to play, so it's oh, it's like a damn. Uh, uh, it, but you know the it drags out on the time because you for example if you want to do the side quest you need to find resources and so on so you can't just take all the resources in one day because you have this energy bar that goes down so you would have to keep going tomorrow and get more resources and so on but if yeah, I have balanced still... the game badly you might finish it very fast uh, but I I hope or I... very slow huh? or very slow I guess yeah so, so, so. So I hope I can uh, balance it somewhat right. And then I think it's going to be a quite hefty demo. Uh, well, yeah, I don't, fuck, I don't remember how we ended up here. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I guess... Uh, not sure either. Anyhow, <laughs> I, I think that's a good, <laughs> good place to wrap it up. Yeah. As well, so... Uh, yeah, well, do you have any conclusion? Pre-orders, uh, uh, collectibles? Yeah, one editions. bad collector edition story uh, I wanted to mention before. The Catherine, it came with a real thong. Did you know that? <laughs> Did it? Yeah, and uh, <laughs> I bought that one. Did it fit? <laughs> <laughs> I forgot it in the bed, and then my ex-wife came home and saw it. So it ended up in a divorce. So that's <laughs> how it can go. No, I'm just kidding. No, I didn't. Have, I didn't buy that one. Uh, but I know it came in a thong, and I thought that was quite fun. Uh, I have Daring. no stories. No, no, nothing else. I love collectors' editions, uh, especially the statue ones when they were looking really cool and sleek. I even want to pop them on my shelves and so on. So fun episode. Thank you, cool. Odo. Have you any yeah, last thanks. words? Uh, yeah, I guess uh, don't buy games on sale, buy them physical, mm -hmm. don't pre-order, uh, something like that. Produce real canvas bags if you can. I <laughs> think that's it. Uh, something I thought about now that we sort of got stuck on, on how to think about making games is <laughs> uh, next episode or some episode, I want to do the id software pr principle ah. uh, id software programming principles by john romero so i think there's a i have to get there's a different lists but i think it's something like 10 11 uh, different uh, principles so cool i want to watch that though. yeah so i uh, think that would be fun to sort of just list them and then talk about each one because mm. i think it's Somehow they click with the, at least they sound so amazing to me. Mm. So that would be really fun to to do and see what people think about it and and what you think about it. I think mm. they, it will click with you as well. Cool. Yeah. Nice. Uh, yeah, I think that's it for the episode. Don't uh, forget to leave a voice message mm. if you have anything to say about this. <laughs> Uh, do you have comments uh, in text? That's fine too. So uh, please leave the, those as well. Oh, actually, I think we have. Um, let me double check here, but I think we have a new comment actually. Ooh. Woo! Let's see here. So this is. Uh, let's see. Uh, perfect. Uh, Oh my god, I think... Sorry, it was a spam comment. God damn it. <laughs> oh, I just saw an email that we had like, oh, you have a new comment. And then I thought, oh, I'm going to save this for the episode. It's going to be so amazing. <laughs> and it's just like this. Oh, hey, are you s here's a link for betting. Blah, blah, blah. Mm. And, oh, sorry. Sorry, people, for keep you waiting. Um, yeah. Anyhow... Hope you enjoyed the episode. Uh, don't know if you have an actual theme or if it's just rambling bullshit, but I enjoyed it at least. It was really fun. I got to see the real Pip Boy. That's amazing in and of itself. Yes. 
Yeah. Thank you so much for Rune for being my amazing co-host. Uh, I look forward to next week. Um, what else? Thank you so much for listening. And uh, I'm doing this in the middle of the night, so I really hope you appreciate it. Have a good one. See you next week. Sayonara!